This is the first in a series of talks on brainstem. It is intended as an introduction to neuroanatomy aimed for medical students and first year neurology residents or fellows. You can see in this frame three views of the brainstem. A posterior view, a lateral view, and an anterior view. We are going to start by drawing and describing the posterior view. Try drawing this figure as I do, that is at the same time as I am doing them. Choose a spot in the lower middle region of the frame and start drawing a line up, slightly tilted, as you see. Then turn it slightly in to create a little dip and then outwards. And then up towards the middle. Then start going down as such and turn it to the other side. Then up and basically mimic the same structures on the left side that were done on the right. And you will hopefully end up with a rather symmetrical structure. Then close it with one and two humps. So you will end up with a structure such as this. Next, take the pencil again and about the middle of the structure draw a line slanting downwards and then up to the other side to end up in about the same level as in the side you started it on. This is the lower border of the rhomboid fossa. Now go to the lowest point of the line we just drew and blacken the bottoms side to side forming a triangle. This is called the obex. The obex is a triangular lamina of great matter of uncertain function. The obex can be used as a landmark to separate the closed medulla below from the open medulla above. The open medulla corresponds to the appearance of the fourth ventricle. I have introduced a view of an embryological specimen. The obec is indicated by the arrow. Now go to the left edge of the line you have drawn in start a line going up, then slant it towards the middle and drop it to mimic the one you just created. This represents the wall and the roof of the rhomboid fossa. It is called rhomboid because of its shape. I have now added a posterior view of the cerebellum to indicate that this view, the one we have just drawn, was obtained once the cerebellum was removed. Now let's go back to the drawing and go to the right side. Draw 
a curved line going down to form a circle. This is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Then go just above it and make another line, sort of like a circle. This represents the superior cerebellar peduncle. Now go next to it and draw a line joining with the edge of the circle with the edge of the tracing at about the same level as you see. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now put the pencil in the location as I have done and draw a line that reaches the lower aspect of the same structure forming something that resembles an oval. This represents the thalamus. Just above the middle of the line just drawn, swing a curvilinear line down and then up. This new structure is the superior colliculus. The superior colliculus is the expression of the addition of many layers of cells and fibers. These cells and fibers are called the superior colliculus nuclear complex. The superior colliculi nuclear complex has many functions, but the most important one is related to vision. The photograph of a frog getting a fly exemplify the function of the superior colliculus in lower animals and how closely linked it is to movements, especially of the tongue in lower species. I have now introduced a photograph of a frog's brain. Look at the size of the colliculi compared to the size of the brain. I have now added a human brain. See the size of our colliculi in relation to our brain. There is a great difference. Focusing back on the drawing, place the pencil in the midline above the roof of the fourth ventricle below the superior colliculus. Make a little hump and extend it to the side. This is the inferior colliculus. It is an important relay station for sound. The inferior colliculus contains the nucleus of the inferior colliculus nucleus. It is, as we just mentioned, related to hearing. Back to the drawing to fill the floor of the rhomboid fossa. By making a curved line as I have just made and then another one just above it. They represent the stria medullaris. The stria medullaris arise from the medullary arcuate nucleus. The medullary arcuate nucleus is a displaced pontine relay nucleus. Hence, sometimes it is called the nucleus precursorius pontis. At least, this name is used often for the rostral most extension of this nucleus. The medullary arcuate nucleus connects the brain with the cerebellum as the pontine 
nucleus do, a point that we will see in a few minutes. The fibers from this nucleus crosses the midline and travels dorsally to reach the surface of the floor of the rhomboid fossa and then turn towards the cerebellum, entering it through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now we go to the mid portion of the roof of the rhomboid fossa and draw a vertical line down. This is the median sulcus. To the side of the median sulcus, we draw a line going down all the way till it is no longer seen within the rhomboid fossa. This is a very important line. It represents the sulcus limitans. I have now added a red vertical line to represent a rather hard division between location of the motor nuclei and the sensory nuclei. This red line is the sulcus limitans. A drawing in this book from 1920 establish the distinction very clearly. The alar plate deals with sensory, separated by the sulcal limitants from the basal plate. The basal plate deals with motor nuclei. On the sensory side, we have the vestibular area. It corresponds to the vestibular nuclei. On the medial side or basal plate, we find the medial eminence. Now, in the medial eminence area, we draw a little circle to represent the facial colliculus. It is produced by the conglomeration of structures, the six cranial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, and the fibers from the seventh cranial nerve as they go back and encircle the sixth nucleus and then proceed forward on the lateral side of the sixth nucleus. It is these three structures that sum up to the formation of the facial colliculus. Next, we put the pencil at the sulcus limitans just above the stria medullaris and make a line slanted medially. Lateral to it, but medial to the sulcus limitans is the vagal trigone. Here I have indicated the vagal trigon with, the, with an arrow in the same embryologic drawing I showed you before. And medial to it is the hypoglossal trigon, which I am indicating in this frame. Before leaving the rhomboid fossa, I want to tell you about two structures. For one of them, I will use a sky blue color pencil. I will use it to put a dot above the facial colliculus. This dot is the norepinephrine rich locus ceruleus. The second structure I want to tell you before leaving the rhomboid fossa is in the lower end of it, where I have just placed the pencil. 
And now I have made a thick short line. This is the area postrema. A chemoreceptor trigger zone for vomiting. Now we go under the obex and draw a line down. This represents the dorsal medial sulcus. By the side of it, we trace a line going up. This line represents the posterior intermediate septum. And next to it, we make a similar line. This line is the posterior lateral septum. thus creating three bands. I have now introduced a transverse cut at the indicated level to show you a different perspective of these bands. The most medial of the bands is the fasciculus gracilis, which I am now indicating. Notice that at this level, few fibers are present, fibers stained in bright blue, whereas the light color blue indicates neurons. To the side, we have the fasciculus cuneatus. As you can see at this level, the fasciculus cuneatus has a significant number of fibers, certainly more fibers than the fracilis. The third structure is the tuberculum sinirum, also called the ash tuberculum or the trigeminal tubercle. This bodge is produced by the nucleus and fibers of the trigeminal nerve. So we finish with the posterior view of the brainstem and we are going to draw the lateral view of the brainstem. I like to draw the lateral view in parts. I start close to the bottom at the middle of the frame and start drawing a line going up and up, then turn it in, advance a little, that is for a short distance, and turn the line down again, and take it at the to the same level where I started. This represents the medulla oblongata, which in Latin means the elongated spine. Next, we should go a little below the midline of the frame, as you can see, and start drawing a line up with a little slant forward, which we should continue and then bend it a little and go down for a short distance then a line straight down and another line horizontally to close the structure this represents the pons which simply means the bridge the dorsal part of the pons provides the floor of the rostral part of the rhomboid fossa. Now we should place the pons on top of the medulla oblongata, as you see in this frame. Next we go to the middle of the page to start drawing the midbrain or the mesencephalon. 
start by drawing a slightly slanted line and extend it, turn it up in a more acute angle and then backwards and continue it with a slight downward slant. Then bring it down, creating a little hump and in, then a second hump and close the structure. This represents the midbrain or mesencephalum. Now we put it together to the previously built structures of the lateral view of the brainstem. So we have the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain, the three components of the brainstem. Now we we'll start drawing the structures that attach the brainstem to the cerebellum. They are called peduncles. I like to start drawing the superior peduncle first. Starting from just below the inferior hump that we made in the brain in the brain stem at the level of the midbrain, we should extend the line for a short distance, then turn it down, and then in the opposite direction back towards the, the midbrain and continue it for a short distance. And then up, closing the structure as you see. I have blackened the inside of the structure here for the sake of clarity, but not the line belonging to the pond as you can see in this picture. Then placing the pencil at the distal end, draw a curved line to give the impression of a structure that, have, that has been cut at the end. This is the superior cerebellar peduncle, nicknamed the brachium conjunctivum. Then go to the corner of the pons and draw a curved line up, bringing it down, then extend the line a little bit in the same manner as the line going up. Do this for a short distance, but not all the way down. And then come back to the top of the structure you just made. Make another curved line again to give the impression of having been cut, as we did for the superior peduncle. Now go down to the end of the line and make another line going up bring it down and then slant it towards the edge of the medulla. Again, we put a curved line at the end to make it as if it had been cut. Then we go to the middle of the line we just made and run a line down as you can see. Then blacken the inside of the newly created structure as I have just done. This is the inferior cerebellar peduncle, nicknamed the reciform body. A second nickname is used for the innermost region of this peduncle. The nickname is Justa restiform body. All the tracks going to the cerebellum from the vestibular nucleus and the spine enter the cerebellum by the inferior peduncle. 
except for the anterior spinocerebellar tract. This tract enters the cerebellum at a superior level mixed with the fibers from the superior cerebral peduncle. Next, we will draw the middle cerebellar peduncle. We start from just about the same place we used to start drawing the lower peduncle, make a line going up, then anteriorly, then down, closing the structure. This is the middle cerebellar peduncle, nicknamed the brachium pontis. I have now introduced a specimen to compare it with the sketch we have just completed. Here indicated is the superior cerebellar peduncle. This peduncle is made of mostly fibers leaving the cerebellum. Injury to the superior cerebellar peduncle produces ipsilateral findings. The findings are hypotonia and postural tremor when attempting to sustain a position. Now I have matched the middle cerebellar peduncle. The middle cerebellar peduncle is the major input fiber to the cerebellum. They arise primarily from the contralateral pontine nuclei. The inferior cerebellar peduncle has, as we have just seen, two components. An anterior or ventral spinocerebellar tract that, although starting with the inferior cerebellar peduncle, leaves it to end up reaching the cerebellum with the superior cerebellar peduncle. And the second component, the largest, the one that carries all the spinocerebellar fibers in the vestibular fibers except for the one we just previously mentioned. Now we will start populating the side view of the brain stem. First, go to the medulla oblongata close to the anterior border and trace a line going down. This is the ventrolateral sulcus, nicknamed the pre-olivary sulcus. Now, a short distance behind, draw a semicircular line as I have done, and then complete an oval structure. This structure is called the olive. It harbors the inferior olivary nucleus and its accessory nuclei. The inferior olivary nucleus is the origin of the cerebellar climbing fibers. Just behind the olive, still in the medulla oblongata, draw another line going down. This line represents the posterolateral sulcus nicknamed the post olivary sulcus. And a short distance behind, yet another line. This line is called the posterior intermediate sulcus. Now, between the posterior intermediate sulcus and the posterior lateral sulcus, Place the pencil just below the pons, close to the posterolateral sulcus, and move it towards the back, that is towards the posterior intermediate sulcus, for a short distance. Bring it down to about half the distance to the bottom, 
and then up again, closing the structure. This is the tuberculum cinerum, which is actually the bulge produced by the spinal nucleus and the track of the cranial nerve 5. A cut of the medulla at this level still shows the nucleus and the track of the fifth cranial nerve. Just in front of the olive, we find the pyramids. At this level, the pyramid hosts and give the name to the track going through it, which is called the pyramidal track. This track continues as a solid track even after the lower end of the olive, as you can see here. Between the pre-olive and post-olive sulcus, forming the edge of the medulla at the level indicated, you have the spinal cerebellar fibers. And behind them are the fibers of the spinal tract of the fifth cranial nerve. And behind those, the fasciculus cuneatus. Now, going to the pons which from this view forms a botch known as the pontine protuberance. We draw a line going posteriorly following the line above. Do the same under the line that we just created with a slight upper slant. Then do the same about five times and then one more time. These lines represent the transverse pontocerebellar fibers. A cut at this level reveals the pontine nuclei, which I mentioned when talking about the middle cerebral peduncle. The pontine Transverse fibers originate mostly from the contralateral pontine nuclei, which receive ipsilateral cerebellar fibers, not only from the motor and sensory areas, but also from prefrontal regions and from the cingulate gyrus. It is these later communications that probably explain the effect of emotion on motor function. The last thing I'd like to show you in this view is the pontomedullary cerebellar angle, where the cerebellum, pons, and medulla meet. Next, we go to the midbrain and draw a line downwards following the anterior edge of the midbrain and do this same two more times. These lines represent the pes pedunculi cerebri, the fibrous part of the ventral part of the cerebral peduncle of the midbrain. The inferior bump is the inferior colliculus. Now go to the lower dorsal area of the lower midbrain as indicated by the pencil, draw a line going up and curve it towards the inferior colliculus. This line represents the lateral lemniscus. This structure forms part of the fibers that connect the cochlear nuclei with the inferior colliculi. The inferior Colliculus receives this activity from the cochlear nuclei and sends it 
to the medial geniculate body in the thalamus. Next, we go in front of the line for the lateral lemniscus and do another line going up, as so. This line represents the medial lemniscus. The medial lemniscus form part of a chain of neurons. The chain starts with the first neuron arising from the dorsal root ganglia. This fiber carry impulses for conscious proprioception, that is sense of position, vibration, sensitivity, and tactile discrimination. The later also called epicritic sensation. These axons climb in the posterior funiculi to the nucleus cuneatus for fibers from the arms and to the nucleus gracilis for fibers coming from the legs. From these nuclei, the second neuron arises. The axons of these neurons form the internal arcuate fibers. These are the fibers that make up the medial lemniscus. These fibers terminate in the ventral posterolateral thalamic nucleus, where we find the third neuron that sends axon to the cortex. We have thus talked about the main features of the lateral view of the brainstem, and we will start with the anterior view which we will draw in parts as we did for the lateral view, starting with the medulla. So again, go to the middle bottom of the page, trace a line going up and slightly to the side, then curve it a little, and bring it slightly down, then up, then down, then up, then down, then up, one more time, and then down, and prolong the line to the level it was started, as you can see. This represents the anterior view of the medulla oblongata. Now we will start drawing the pons. For this, we go to the horizontal middle of the frame over the lower half and start there. We start with a curved line, prolong it to the side, and then start turning it up and bringing it slightly in, advance it and as you bend, bend it in, continue towards the middle until you actually reach it. Then make a little dip and start mimicking the figure on the other side until you reach just about the same level as you started. Then just go around it towards the middle again and we have drawn the pons, which I have incorporated to the medulla in this frame. Next let's start drawing the anterior view of the midbrain. You start in the middle of the frame, begin by drawing a line up and slanted to the side, then up and in, 
and then down creating a dip as you go up on the other side then just mirror the same structure on that side and bring it to the level that you started so now we have built the midbrain and I will incorporate it as you can see here to the other two previously drawn structures the last structure that I will draw is not part of the brain stem but I think it is a good place to introduce it go back to the middle of the page and start making a line going up but creating a little hump and turn it up again and further up and to the side before turning it in then start going down as you can see bring it in again towards the line that you previously made this structure represents the right salamus think as if the model is looking at you because now you are looking at the anterior view of the brain stem now duplicate the same structure on the other side that is on the left side and incorporate the three previous views to this structure now we will start populating the anterior view starting by going to the top of the medulla right in the middle and drawing a line down this is the ventral median fissure then go to the next dip and do the same this line represents the ventrolateral sulcus between the ventromedial fissure and the ventrolateral sulcus we have the pyramid a structure we mentioned a few minutes ago now go down on the other side of the midline and place the pencil a little bit under the halfway in the medulla and draw some multiplication signs on top of each other as I am doing here as you see these multiplication signs represent the pyramidal decusation here I have introduced a cut at the indicated level notice the massive crossing of fibers the crossing is indeed massive but also sudden and peculiar 90% of fibers cross suddenly they travel on the contralateral side of the spine and make contact with neurons also in the contralateral side I have represented the connection by the off shoot green lines 2% do not cross and go ipsilaterally to reach the anterior segment of the spinal cord but ultimately cross to the other side 8% do not cross and go to the ipsilateral funiculus that is to the ipsilateral lateral funiculus and make contact with neurons in the same side but what is really unusual and at times clinically important is that arm fibers go down in the pyramid medially cross high in the decusation and then go laterally as you can see in this frame represented whereas leg fibers come down 
in the pyramid more laterally, cross below the fibers for the arms and then take a more medial position. The clinical importance of this arrangement can be appreciated in the following case. Here the patient is a 12 year old boy that is attempting to raise both arms and both legs simultaneously and as you can see the right arm is weak and so is the left leg. This is called hemiplegia cruciata. It is due to a lesion at the site shown by the red burst. The arm fibers are injured after crossing and the leg fibers before crossing. This is one to remember because you may find a patient with it and you may find it in your exam. Okay, so no more about the about the pyramid decusation. But before leaving the medulla, I just like to mention that to the side of the pyramid is the olive. Now going to the middle of the upper pons, we make lines, curved lines across. As you can see, we make multiple lines make them slightly more depressed right at the middle and do as many as it takes to get down to the medulla. This is the basilar groove. It is called so because the basilar artery lives there. To the side is the middle cerebellar peduncle. Now go to the midbrain and draw lines slanted up and laterally as you can see then another one as you can see and a few others to fill the whole area they represent the basis pedunculi then go to the center and blanket the area as I have done to represent the interpeduncular fossa. Rostally, in the interpeduncular fossa, there is an area that harbors the posterior perforated substance. The structure above the midbrain, as we have already mentioned, is the thalamus. Now, I am pointing to the lateral geniculate, an important visual center, and now to the medial geniculate involved with hearing. Inquiring minds would ask, what about cranial nerves? Cranial nerves anatomy will be touched in different talks and exercises. Here, we will just talk about their external anatomical origin. Cranial nerve 12 rootlets are attached between the pyramids and the olive. Cranial nerve 11 has fibers from two different regions. The cranial fibers emerge from behind the olive. The spinal fibers emerge from the side of the cervical spinal segments 1 through 4 or 5. The rootlets of cranial 10 also arise from just behind the olive. And the same goes for cranial nerve 9 fibers. These three nerves, the accessory, the vagus, and the glossopharyngeal, come out of the skull through the jugular canal. The cranial fibers, initially forming part of the accessory nerve quickly leave it to go to the vagus by way of connections. These connections are called internal rami of the accessory nerve. Cranial nerve 8, the vestibulocochlear nerve is attached to the pontomedullary junction 
close to the cerebellar peduncle. The seventh, the facial and intermediate nerve is also attached to the pontomedullary junction but more medially. The most medial of all at this junction is the abducens or cranial nerve 6. This photograph was given to me when I was a pediatric neurology fellow by Dr. Von Buren as a slide. I thought it was very good then, I still think it is now. You can see the pons, the medulla, cranial nerve 6, cranial nerve 7, and cranial nerve 8. All three are in the pontomedullary line, and the eighth is the one that is closest to the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Cranial nerve 5, the tegeminal, emerges from the pons just before the external formation of the middle cerebellar peduncle. This is a view that shows the emergence of the trigeminal nerve. The trochlear nerve is the only cranial nerve that emerges through the back of the brainstem. And then this nerve goes to the opposite side, innervating the superior oblique muscle contralateral to its origin. Here, the arrow is pointing to, to it in the dorsal view of the brainstem, here in the lateral view, and here in the anterior view. This image also shows it on one side, as you can see, pointed by the arrow. Next, we have cranial nerve 3, the oculomotor nerve, which emerges from the lower midbrain close to the midline. You can see the oculomotor nerve well dissected here. You can also see the second cranial nerve, that is the optic nerve and the first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve. Just remember that these two nerves, that is the optic and the olfactory nerve, although called nerve, they are not so. And they are not so because the supporting cells are of neuroglia origin and not Schwann cells as peripheral nerves are. Further discussion about cranial nerve will be presented to you in other videos and other teaching modalities as we previously mentioned. Thank you very much for your attention.